Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about medicines manufacturing today. And, uh, but at first, I'd like to thank the ABPI for this opportunity. Um, I think it may be unique that someone from manufacturing is here to talk to this conference. And it's certainly unique to be up front at the beginning of this in such illustrious company. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, ABPI, BIA, and Innovate UK for helping support the Medicines Manufacturing Industry Partnership over the last three years. These organisations put resources into, this, uh, into MMIP to match the industry. Industry put three full-time employees into this to try and make traction. And I'll tell you a little bit more about what MMIP is and what we've been doing in a few minutes. But let me first of all say why Medicines Manufacturing in the UK is important. Um, and if I talked about gross value add to the UK economy, the gross value add to the UK economy per employee in medicines manufacturing is higher than any other sector, including automotive or aerospace. It's almost double. So put crudely, one pound invested in medicines manufacturing returns much more to the economy than anything else in manufacturing. However, the gross value add to the UK economy has been in decline since 2009 as the global pharma industry has contracted and consolidated, companies have relocated elsewhere. The UK also has a fantastic scientific innovation capability. Steve touched on some of that later, uh, earlier. But we've been pretty disastrous at converting that into commercial products and economic value to the UK. So it's really important to get on and do something about that. And it's important to do it now because there's a technological opportunity, manufacturing is changing, and there's an emergence of a much more complex family of medicines around potent medicines and cell and gene therapy, which I will come to. But the life science industrial strategy really is the opportunity for this. There's an opportunity for industry and government to work together to make the ecosystem work. And I think that's an opportunity that we have already been involved in and we need to seize that with both hands and change the script and make the UK the go to place for medicines manufacturing. So, what have we been doing? Um, the Medicines Manufacturing Industry Partnership is set up about three years ago. It was in response to a government industry initiative to get the industry to speak to government with one voice. Because the government said, you roll up to see us every other week and you keep talking to us about different things. So we set up the Medicines Manufacturing Industry Partnership and we work very, very closely with BASE, the Office of Life Science, with BIA, ABPI and a number of other stakeholders. I will put up some slides as we go through here to, to talk to you about it, but I won't I'll talk around the slides rather than to them specifically. So we've been working on a number of areas. The first one that we worked on was tax and fiscal arrangements. And the reason for this is that as the industry has consolidated and, and has resettled manufacturing around the globe, you will not be surprised to know, and a number of your companies will have done this, they've settled in Ireland, Singapore, Switzerland, and they've settled there for tax reasons in the main. So we needed to level the playing field as far as tax and fiscal incentives was concerned, and I'm very pleased to tell you that we will end up with an effective tax rate around 10 to 13 percent due to the combination of the changes in corporate tax rate, the patent box, and R&D tax credits. But we need to do more in this area because for small and medium-sized enterprises particularly, it's very important that they settle their GMP manufacturing facilities in the UK. And we are currently about bottom of the G20 in encouraging that to happen. So we need to find a way with the government to change that. But it's not just tax that we've been working on. We've also been working on technology, We've been working on skills, we've been working on regulatory environment, and we've been working extremely closely with the MHRA. They are a fantastic organization. They're recognized globally as being one of the leading regulators, they're pro-industry and they're pro-innovation. And we've been working to build a community and we are now capable of talking to government with a single voice that more or less represents industry, be that large or small. But we recognize that our world is changing. We heard already in the panel discussion this morning that there's substantial changes in the cost of healthcare. There's a lot of reference, interestingly, we haven't rehearsed this or put it together, but a number of us will talk about the ecosystem. Um, the cost of healthcare, the availability of data and information is changing the world in which we live. The innovative medicines that are coming through are much more different to where they've been in the, future, uh, in the past, 
and the patient expectation is very, very different. But in manufacturing, things are changing as well. The portfolios that are coming through now are much more complex, high potency medicines that require a different type of manufacturing. It's also this sort of concept of the last 20 or 30 years in manufacturing has been all about scale to try and drive down cost. It's not scale anymore. It's much more specific, bespoke. And it's not low-cost labor that drives cost of goods in manufacturing anymore. It's technology that will drive productivity. All of these things are changing. And we have been working very, very closely as a medicines manufacturing industry partnership to try and make these things come together. So on the technology front, we have been working with the government. We hope to develop what is called a medicines manufacturing innovation center. This will be a place where pre-competitive work can be done by companies large and small. People will learn from one another and people will take that technology and apply it to the products and the processes that they have. Specifically, we should be able to reduce the overall investment and time to bring new technologies to market. An example might be continuous manufacturing of active pharmaceutical ingredient. I just show you this because I like plant and equipment. And you can see on one side we've got the traditional vessels that measured in hundreds and sometimes thousands of litres, large scale chemicals, lots of issues with green chemistry. And on the left hand side, this is a room actually in Singapore uh, from my previous company where we put the same capability of plant in a single room with continuous manufacturing. The scale of that is completely different, the cost of goods are completely different, and there's a reason why we put it in Singapore. That should have been put in the UK because the conditions should have been made conducive to that. If I move on a little bit now to, if I can, um, to advanced therapies. This is an area that medicines manufacturing have been particularly involved with in over the last two years. And in 2016, we set up a specific work stream with the help of George Freeman, who was then the Life Sciences uh, Minister for Life Sciences. And George put a lot of effort into this and created quite a lot of focus. But through the year of 2016, we brought together a really good industry body. I hope there are some people in this room because they worked incredibly hard to make this happen. And by November, we came up with an action plan. The action plan was published. You can see a photograph of it. it looks a little bit like this. But inside, uh, there are six specific actions, and I'll paraphrase them to keep this presentation short. But the first one was to basically level the playing field on fiscal arrangements and make the UK an attractive place to be. The second one was to target and capture internationally mobile investment and make that a very simple process. If an indigenous company in the UK wanted to invest, it was simple to work with government, or if there was an overseas company, it was simple to work with government. The third action was to maintain the science and innovation funding that supports the industry. There is a lot of effort and energy goes in by a number of groups within the UK to help fund innovative science, and we want to continue that, but to focus it on what the industry wants. And we were very clear with uh, Innovate UK about where the issues were in our supply chains, and one of them was viral vector manufacture. They responded immediately and set up two competitions that have enabled a number of companies to advance their viral vector manufacturing capability. We, we, the fourth action was excuse me, to set up an end-to-end -end talent management process. We've done a lot of work on this, and it's not about PhDs necessarily, it's not about graduates, it's much about the grassroots entry-level technician. Interestingly, the apprenticeship levy creates a massive opportunity for us to use the funding from that to focus it on what the industry needs. And this phrase, what the industry needs, has been at the heart of what MMIP has begun to define. The fifth action, very interesting one, was to set up out a clear, swift, and predictable, viable route to market for these innovative cell and gene products and give industry confidence that the UK was serious about being a global hub in this platform. We've talked a little bit about the NHS, and I will come back to that briefly in a moment. And finally, and last but not least, to utilize the MHRA to de de develop a long-term strategy around the standards for cell and gene therapy, which are so new, using the MHRA's expertise, we can become a leader in the setting of standards which will really assist companies to locate in the UK. So I mention these, um, the, the advanced therapies particularly, because this is a platform that's yet to leave the UK. The R&D, the research, the capability in the UK is very high, 
But if we look backwards for a moment, we've seen the movement of small molecule manufacture to places like Singapore and Ireland, and we've, we've manufactured very little of our biological portfolio considering how good we were at developing it in the first place. So this is an opportunity to prevent cell and gene therapy to leave. And as I come towards the end of my presentation, um, I'll just move this on. That one's not really necessary. I think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. Despite my youthful looks, I have been around for a while. Not when Fleming, I was not a research assistant for Fleming. <laughs> but he, he invented serendipitously or discovered penicillin in 1928. But it wasn't much use until Florian Chain came along 12 years later to create an industrial scale process for that fantastic medicine. And um, that gave birth to the industry that we kind of know it now that became large scale heavy industry in fact, but still very important. There's a site in the west of Scotland um, where we employ 450 people directly still manufacturing penicillin, penicillin materials. And that will be there for another 20 or 30 years to come because they have continued to improve the science and could produce it cost effectively versus China or India or anywhere else. The site that I started my career in in the northeast of England was built 70 years ago. And it was built for penicillin. And it survived shipbuilding, it survived mining, it survived steel industry. And it hasn't made a molecule of penicillin for 35 years. But in that 35 years, it has employed between 1,000 and 2,000 people every single day of the year. And the contribution to the UK economy, both locally and through exports, has been huge. And the reason it is still there is because once the routes were set for complex manufacturing processes, they are really quite difficult to shift also happened to be part of a UK company that was committed to the UK and was led by very good people who evolved the capability of that site to the stage where they are now building a plant of approximately 110 million pounds to, to produce the latest sterile medicines in that company's portfolio. And I was going to kind of say to, the, to your right of this picture, this really is the future of our industry and miniaturization of existing process through a different advanced manufacturing technology, but also the whole concept of cell biology and cell and gene therapy is going to radically change this industry over the next 20 to 30 years. And sometime in the, probably the younger people in this room, it won't be necessarily factories in the northeast of England that are making medicines that be cells in individuals' bodies that are making the medicines that they require. Now, I was going to close this presentation um, about this point, and uh, just by mentioning that the life science industrial strategy is a one-off opportunity for us to get it right, for us to build on the capability of the industry that we've got and to work with the government in a way we have done, I think, with Medicines Manufacturing Industry Partnership and actually create some momentum to create the conditions that will cause existing manufacturers to expand in the UK where they have a choice and new companies to come here. I was going to leave it at that point because the opportunity is huge in the life science industrial strategy. And as I was watching Crystal Palace and Tottenham on the television last night, I realized I was about to make a dreadful mistake because I was talked to you about manufacturing and hopefully you're thinking about manufacturing and the mistake I've made was to forget, to, I had forgotten to tell you about where manufacturing plays in this ecosystem. And I had made the same mistake that industry does every day and that government does every day. What they do every day is they talk to each other, maybe on a Monday on manufacturing, on a Tuesday on R&D, and on a Wednesday on they argue about access and uptake. But if only we could talk about the whole system from discovery, through clinical evaluation, through development, through manufacturing, through uptake and treatment, if only we could talk about that ecosystem, we would see how important it was that the UK does use and reimburse the innovative medicines, because that provides the data to inform discovery at the next phase of generation of medicines, and it also provides the finance to create the jobs in research the jobs in clinical, the jobs in manufacturing, the jobs in development, and these jobs create the gross value add that can drive the UK economy. So, at that point, I will close my presentation and thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much.